Hello there, it's James B. Welcome to my podcast. It's the 27th of December, the year's almost over, and I hope you've made plans for New Year's Eve because most of the shows are probably sold out. This is the first time since 1985. I'm not working New Year's Eve. This time, I've chosen not to work New Year's Eve. Uh, but I still have lots of suggestions for you. The thing is, lots of them are probably sold out. So, uh, try your best. Call up some clubs if you're looking for something to do. Or, join me 9 p.m. to midnight on Jazz FM 91. www.jazz.fm if you're somewhere other than uh, this area. Uh, 91.1 FM if you are in this area, but you can listen to my New Year's Eve special commercial free at 9 p.m. to midnight. Uh, anyway, we're going to go to clubs right now and tell you what you can do right now during taint season. It's that soft, sensitive little moment between Christmas and New Year's. Taint Christmas, taint New Year's. Okay, Lula Lounge tonight, Michelle de Quavedo. One of my favorite percussionists, but I found out in the last little while, I've seen him play guitar and sing as well. He is so talented. He's there early, and then Marta Elena and Salsa Star. She's beautiful, amazing voice, kick-ass band. You will love it tonight, lulalounge.ca, for all the listings. And tomorrow, Salsa Saturday, La Borenquina. You can salsa dance, and you will have fun. And Sunday is extra saucy. Saucy Sunday. Drag brunch from 12 till 3 p.m. And holiday burlesque at 7 p.m. What a cool club. Little Lounge is so amazing. Drag queen brunch, and then a burlesque at, at night. What a nice thing to do. That's on Sunday the 29th. Uh, and then New Year's Eve, Havana Ventu is playing. Again, check to see if they're not sold out. Make dinner reservations if you can. It's a really cool place to go early. And they are open from 6.30 p.m. to 3 a.m. That is crazy. All right. Over at Jazz Bistro, Galen Weston Band is there tonight. Galen Weston gets a lot of airplay on radio and on Jazz FM 91. Uh, he's a fantastic guitar player. And uh, he'll be packing them in tonight, no doubt. Uh, Gabby Epstein and Jeremy Lepalm are there tomorrow night. Uh, Christmica. Chris it's Christmas and Hanukkah mixed together. It's a variety show. And I don't know Jeremy well, but Gabby Epstein, wow. She is awesome. She has a, so, a song called Show Off uh, that I get a kick out of. She's really good. Musical theater girl with some real jazz chops. Um, New Year's Eve, Cold Jack, R&B, Soul and Funk, high level playing, always sells out. So you, you should see if there's tickets left, might be gone. And then over at Use Room Live, Susie Vinnick is tonight. I mentioned her last week. Uh, amazing singer, songwriter, guitarist, blues master. She's bringing blues to the hues tonight. And Don Ross and his Happy Fingers are there on Saturday. Uh, probably one of the best loved guitar players in Canada. And uh, what just a genius. And then Winter Garden Orchestra on Monday. Uh, if you love, as I do, uh, Busby Berkeley musicals and just old-timey fun, the Winter Garden Orchestra are your cup of tea. And what a great thing to do before New Year's. So that is on Monday. And then on New Year's, Oakland Stroke, I understand it is completely sold out. Lou Pamonte and the gang, uh, they played there before and it's jammed. There may be some standing room only tickets if, uh, if you want to pop down there for a little bit. June Garber, Old Mill Inn, Homesmith Bar, sold out for New Year's. Uh, I love this bar so much, and they have been supporting this uh, podcast from the beginning. So thank you to all my friends at Old Mill Toronto and uh, to the Homesmith Bar in particular. Also, uh, I might as well give you a head up for next year. Just pencil this in. April 14th is going to be my big birthday party. It's also technically the birthday of uh, my business partner, Lorenzo De Gianfelice. Uh, so we're going to have a big party there. And it's the annual benefit for Unison Fund that I host, uh, 20 bands in 10 rooms. So I'm just telling you that ahead of time to mark April 14, 2020 in your calendar. Okay, well, uh, that's about it. That's a very short list because it's taint season and people are busy. But I'm glad there's some clubs for you to check out. And I do want to thank the people that have been with me all this time. Aaron Barbarian and Barbarian Steakhouse. 
Thank you for your support. Paul Barber and Paul Barber and Associates, it's a great uh, organization. They help me with my finances. They can help you too. BarberFinancial.com. And of course, everybody on Patreon. Um, in fact, you know what? When I think about Patreon and what some of you people have done for me, uh, I re I'm really grateful. If you aren't donating and you want to, five bucks a month, 10 bucks a month, um, that would be great. And the guy we're going to go talk to now knows a thing or two about uh, crowdsourcing, social media. Uh, he's, he's, I, I don't want to say he's a mini-me. He's his own man. But we both are like brothers in our mission to get people to go out to clubs, leave the house, and go meet people and hang out in some clubs. You're going to love what he has to say. So let's go right now to see Ori Dagan. And cheers! Cheers! Hey, how are you? Excellent. How awesome. Are you? I'm good. So you are not camera shy. You have an incredible Instagram account. We're going to talk about your singing in in a second. But tell me about your love of social media or how you do it all. Well, you know, there's uh, it's an amazing tool of spreading the word, and uh, I think my greatest inspiration in life is Sheila Jordan, who calls herself a jazz ambassador. So uh, I think of myself that way because uh, it's what I love to do is play the music, teach the music, and get more people into the music. Yeah, and it's amazing what you've been doing. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, you started figuring out that you loved singing, but when did it go jazz? Well, actually, I grew up playing classical music. Uh, I played piano from a young age until about 16. Did not have any jazz in my life, really, until I was about 18 years old. Uh, at that time, I listened to an album called Mac the Knife Live in Berlin, recorded February 13th, 1960. <laughs> and it was Ella Fitzgerald, of course, and it just changed my life. I just started to sing along to that record. Do you believe that she forgot the lyrics and started vamping, or do you believe that... I think so. Really? See, I think she did. I think she kind of maybe had her... She was like hmm, what am I going to do with this? So she had maybe some rhymes that might work. But I have studied that performance, and I think it was genuinely in the moment. And, and it, it so inspired me, because if you listen to that, it, it means that there are no mistakes in jazz. It's all about, and that's a, a Miles Davis quote, there are no mistakes. It's all about how you deal with that mistake, and, and that makes it so real and genuine and like life. Play a bum note, hit it two or three times, and it's now in a cool arrangement. <laughs> <laughs> right. When you, uh, so classical into jazz via Ella Fitzgerald, yes. nice, nice door to, to walk in. Yes. Um, and then where did it go? Was it like Mark Murphy, or how, how deep did you go into scat singing and that kind of jazz? Well, the after Ella, I mean, I, it was just Ella for me for a couple of years, actually. I didn't really get anyone else. And and, and the, are you a teenager at that time? Yeah, yeah. I was like in my late teens. And and uh, I just was like obsessed with Ella. And of course, she recorded over 2,000 songs. So those are still the days of CDs. So I remember when Tower Records closed, I just went there and it was 50% off everything. It was like, oh, I've got to get this, I've got to get this. So I got into some other uh, artists on, on Verve, which was uh, the label Norman Grands made for Ella. Uh, so I got into Sarah Vaughan. I really liked her. And then I got into Anita O'Day. And that changed my life. Because I think Anita is probably my greatest influence after Ella. Uh, in the in the, the way that she uses humor, in the way that she uh, uses rhythm, in the way that she makes arrangements. Uh, she's such an amazing, uh, she really was an amazing lady. And of course, I got to meet her and present her in concert at York University. Um, so Right, you were actually in university mm -hmm. and already promoting shows and bringing that people in. That was my in. first concert. Wow. That was my first I was one. there. Yes, you were. <laughs> amazing oh, show. Oh my God. I can't tell the full story of that concert without drinking. It, is, it was so <laughs> intense and stressful, but it was so gratifying. And the best moment was seeing little 85-year-old Anita sitting at a little table and, and signing like a hundred autographs and, and her manager saying, she never sits still for this long. Right. <laughs> um, so so it, was, it was a gratifying moment. But uh, I, my favorite, I guess my greatest influences are female singers uh, and also some great horn players like uh, Lester Young's my favorite musician and Charlie Parker, Dexter Gordon. Um, for male singers, it's, all, it's that era, isn't it, for you? It, yeah, it's, it's the that... 30s, 40s, yeah. and, and 50s. Uh, that, that's my favorite time. And, and, and they're male singers, Mark Murphy for sure, Dave Lambert, John Hendricks, uh, Bobby McFerrin is just crazy. You know, it's, it, there's, there's a 
a lot of inspiration, a lot of the old stuff. Have you seen Al Jarreau live? Or did you before he passed away? No, I didn't, but he's something. I I used to laugh when I watched him on TV thinking, wow, that guy looks happier than me. (laughs) But then when I met him, it's genuine happiness. It's pure joy. He's not putting it on. That's him. And mastery. I mean, that's the thing. These these people are masters. And uh, you can learn a lot from from listening and studying. But I think, truly, to, to learn to do jazz, you have to be out there doing it. That's right. how you learn to do Well, jazz. I was going to ask you about your time at York. I, a lot of people that have been on the show have been to U of T or Humber. Mm-hmm. Uh, not too many York or, or Mohawk or, or, or McGill. So nice to hear from someone who went to York. What was, was some of your favorite memories there or favorite teachers? Well, I, uh, my greatest mentor there was Rita DeGent, and she kicked my ass. I mean, she was so hard on me, and I appreciated it uh, because there's a tendency in singers sometimes to get lazy and to just, you know, kind of get cocky even and just be like, it's a, it's a weird thing. And, and it's all, again, going back to Sheila Jordan, it's all about dedication. That's the key. If you want to do this music, you've got to be dedicated to it. I appreciate you saying that because I hear it from a lot of band leaders, but rarely from an actual singer, that singers can be lazy or that oh, singers man. might get on stage way before they're ready. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So, um, you know, it's it, discipline and dedication. And so, yes, I did study with Rita DeGant. However, when I was at York, it was interesting. Uh, I ended up doing classical music there classical vocal music. I did uh, jazz vocals for about three years, and I just didn't have great technique because I didn't grow up singing. A lot of singers, they sing in the church or whatever, Mm -hmm. and I I did not have that in Israel. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Nor when we moved to Canada, it just wasn't, I didn't, I was very shy. Believe it or not, I was so shy when I was in school. I I didn't even raise my hand if I knew the answer. Mm -hmm. And uh, music has really helped me to kind of get it out of my shell. You know, Some would say you're brutally confident on stage. <laughs> <laughs> That's the opposite of shy. Well, you know, it, I'm Gemini, so <laughs> depends on the day. So York overall, like, did you end up leaving there with a big student debt or did you like, was the overall feeling when you were done? Was it, was it like, wow, that was worth it? Or well, was there any, interestingly, by the time I was done at York, I had done, uh, this was by the way, after two years of U of T English. Because when I, when I finished high school, I was a writer. I won the Creative Writing Award in my high school. And uh, so I went into the English program at U of T. And that year discovered jazz music. And uh, I did Jesus Christ Superstar musical theater when I was there. Then I did York. Who I, were you? I was Caiaphas. Ah! No, wait. We need a more permanent solution to our problem. <laughs> <laughs> Your voice would be great for that. Oh, God. So anyway, um, I did five years at York three of jazz, two of classical, and I was just didn't feel like I was done. And there were three musicians on our scene that inspired me. And they all went to Humber College. And those three were Lila Bialy, Brandy Disterheft, Sophia Perlman, specifically. And I remember those three, it was like a trifecta. Because mm-hmm. I was watching them and I was like, I want what they're having. Like, they are brilliant, they're unique, They've got their own voice. Right. They should, They should. All three all of them three have a completely were, unique take. Yeah, and it had, I don't think it had anything to do with them being female. It, I just loved what they were doing. And I just thought, huh, I, maybe I could go to Humber. I know I already have a degree, but I just want to go. So I found a way to go, and I was there for two years. And uh, by the time I was two years of Humber then, I was like already out there playing some gigs. I was playing with with uh, Jordan O'Connor and Bernie Sinensky, I had this house gig. So I was just like, all right, I'm done with school. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I uh, made my first record that was uh, came out in 2009 called Scat Got My Tongue. Mm-hmm. Now you said Humber? Mm-hmm. And then what about York? No, no, so it was five years York. Oh, years five Humber. years York, two five years. Five of- years, because that work. Anita O'Day concert, like I had to drop most of my courses to make that happen. <laughs> it was just the nuttiest thing. What advice would you give kids with balancing schoolwork and getting out in the real world at the same time? It's, it's a tough thing, but uh, it's possible. And, and by, what I do tell kids and students is, you know, if you want to do this music, you've got to be out there. You know, you've got to be out there doing it. Don't stay in a practice room. 
you know, like it's great, practice rooms are great, but it's a social music, you know, it's, it's born in, in bars and clubs and, 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 you know, it's late night and, and it's improvising and it's playing with people you don't know and it's playing with people who are better than you and, and it's learning the hard way and it's learning lots and lots and lots of tunes. And there you are know. so many places in Toronto and the GTA where people of different levels can play together, can do a jazz jam or can show up at a little cafe, right? Well, sure. And the magic of this music, truly, I think, is when you're able to go to a jam session anywhere, you know, it, 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 and just call a blues or call a, a rhythm changes or call a song that everybody knows, Autumn Leaves. And because, and, uh, like I said, you know, you learn a lot from records. But what, what, what's different is live, when you, when you hear something and see something, you understand the why. Like, why are they making that choice right now? And, and that, that choice in the moment has so much more meaning as an audience member and as a musician, because you get the context of it. You're like, oh, you know, it's, I think to me what I love about jazz is the element of surprise and, and the fact that it's different every night. You think it's kind of like sitting in a in, in in a public transit and hearing people speak a different language, but understanding what they're saying somehow. Well, it's a universal language because, That's, but yeah, because when people hear jazz musicians trading off each other and yeah. really nailing it, they have no idea how that's done. If you're not a musician, right. it's a very interesting thing to to watch. Yeah, trading is the coolest. And the singer that really got me into, I do a lot of trading with with horn players. That's Anita O'Day. I mean, that was her thing. If you ever listen to her version of like Four Brothers or um, all sorts of Hershey Bar, all sorts of tunes like that. And Ella did it sometimes. Ella traded with like um, some saxophone players like Paul Gonzalez with Duke Ellington Orchestra. You can find that on YouTube. Okay. But Anita really kind of made it like a statement. For her, I think it was like a feminist statement. It was like conversation, but it was also like, I'm, I'm your equal. Yeah. You know, uh, and I like that in terms of thinking about improvising, you know, because before you can scat a whole solo, it's great if you can scat a sentence, a phrase, and, and, and make that into a conversation. I have had some people glowing reviews about how you approach scat singing with people who have never done it. Uh, Pam Hyatt is a great oh, example. Yeah. But people who just say, you somehow shake them loose so they can actually do this. How often do you do like large seminars, like where you're 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 teaching a group of people? I've done it over the years. I did it at York U. I did it privately. I did it uh, through the Kensington Market Jazz Festival. Uh, and what is it I, you I do? Like do how do how do you get people to be that brave? Somebody who just sings a normal song and now has to make up a scat solo. Uh, well, you know, it it all depends on the individual. I think when when it comes to teaching, you have to like kind of find a way. But for me, the secret is is kind of getting people to discover the joy of jazz and the freedom of it. Uh, and I think if anyone has a really hard time with scat singing, it's usually people that want to get it right, you know, which is a very classical way of approaching something. It's like there's notes on a page and you have to follow those notes. And my approach is a lot more organic and it's more like make this sound, you know, like forget about the syllables. You know, make this sound, pretend you're a trumpet, pretend you're a saxophone. Um, what would that sound like? And, and, you know, it's kind of like going off script and, and just making it about communication, making it about the joy of music. With your second album, so the first scat got my tongue. Yeah. That, that got a lot of airplay. And tell me about the second album. So second album uh, is called Less Than Three, and that came out in 2012. And that one was really about pushing myself to explore non-standards. Right, and some, and some deeper voice stuff, like different, different vocal techniques too, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. And, and I wrote some a couple of tunes, I wrote a tune in Hebrew on that one. Uh, it was like a blues in Hebrew about peace called Nu Azma, which means, well, so what? Uh, and I wrote Googleable on that one uh, with the, the amazing, the great Marquis Sweater. Uh, and uh, it was produced with uh, Marquis Sweater and Lisa Particelli. So it was a really, really cool. I did Lady Gaga, I did Madonna, I did Elton John. Right. And Googleable had a video with it that did really well, too. That was my first ever music video. Yeah. Googleable. And uh, it was, a, I think it's a really, I'm proud of that song because I've always, in my mind, I, my goal is to kind of make jazz kind of relatable to people that don't know what it is. Uh, and, and, 
that I remember that actually got a lot of play on CBC that song and I had people contacting me and being like hey man I love your Google song um, so there was that and uh, that it was a really fun album. I had uh, Jane Bennett. That was the first time I worked with Jane Bennett. Uh, she guested with the Eric Saint Laurent trio on a, a jazz version of an Israeli folk song called Eretz Zavat Chalav. And I actually, believe it or not, got the idea to do that from Nina Simone, who sang that song in the 60s. Wow. And I, I, was, I remember watching this clip of Nina Simone singing this song and thinking like, Man, her Hebrew is horrible. <laughs> Maybe I should do this song. But uh, again, like I said, that to me is the magic of jazz. And, and the, the power of singing standards is that it gives you an opportunity to interpret something that everybody knows. Right, people can hold way. on to something and then they can see what you have done to it because you're starting from something. They yeah, yeah, I love that. Well, speaking of that, the Nat King Cole tribute where, where, I mean, other than you loving him, what, where did that come from? Oh, this is a great story. So the truth is I didn't get Nat King Cole for a long time. The, the Nat King Cole that I knew was more, you know, Mona Lisa, nature boy, beautiful voice, obviously. But it, I, I'm into like wild improvising. That's my thing. That's why I love Lambert Hendrickson Ross and Anita O'Day and Mark Murphy and, and Ella sometimes and Sarah. And I didn't get it. And then uh, my buddy, Nathan Hiltz, great guitarist, great musician, a good friend, says to me one day, I go over to his house and he says, Hey, Ori, have you ever heard this early Nat King Cole trio stuff? It's really good stuff. You should check it out. Maybe you could sing some of this stuff. So I listened to some stuff and, and one of those tunes is called That's What. And it's actually Nat King Cole scat singing, which blew my mind. And the rest of the tunes, I just was like, that piano playing is genius. So it was actually, at first, it was his piano playing that got me like, wow, how did I not even realize how great a piano player this guy was? And then I started to listen more and more, and I, I heard him do songs in French, in Japanese, in... Uh, Spanish. I was like, wow, that's pretty prolific. And so I just kind of gained a real genuine appreciation for him. And you know what, until that point, I'd always thought, I don't want to do a tribute album. It's so derivative and boring. And I've heard singers do that where they copy the arrangements of the old. I'm like, what's the point? We've got YouTube now. You know, you don't need to do a tribute to someone and copy them. So I thought, how do I make this album unique? So uh, Nathan and I collaborated on five original songs inspired by Nat King Cole's music, his life, his legacy. And I think that made the album pretty unique, but we weren't done. I just thought there's something else that I could do with this. So inspired by trends in the music business, uh, Nathaniel, a tribute to Nat King Cole, was the first ever visual album in the history of the jazz genre. And... Uh, my team was able to pull this off through the amazing support of fans and a couple of, of people that never met me and just heard about it through the internet. Uh, but it was basically crowdfunded and we did uh, 12 different music videos and got this music out to all these film festivals. And I got to go to Korea thanks to a song called Bibimbap, which uh, was inspired by the Frim Fram sauce. So it, like a double entendre food song. And uh, we had this music video that we made with someone we'd never met. She lives in England. And it's an just, amazing video. Oh, thank you. And a catchy tune. It's a fun tune. It's not... It, yeah. Your songs should should be novelty songs, but somehow they're not. <laughs> somehow they're beyond that. Same thing with Googleable. They're, they're really good songs, but they are kind of novelty in what you're singing about. Well, you know... There's so many love songs out there. Like, that's most of the genre. Like, more than 50%, for sure, yeah. of jazz. is. And I love that. I do love... I did write a love song called Sweetheart. I do love love songs. But sometimes you just want to swing, and you just want to make it about something else. Tell me about Sing of the Cactus. I think that was my favorite video. Yes, that, that just hit 142,000 views. It was directed by Becky O'Neill. It is... Uh, daughter of Jeannie Becker. Daughter of Jeannie Becker. Thank you, Jeannie, for recommending her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that song was inspired by reading Nat King Cole's biography and, and reading about him practicing for hours and hours and hours, 
sneaking out of the house against his parents' wishes to see other musicians play, like uh, Earl Hines was his great inspiration. And me thinking to myself, gee, I always thought Nat King Cole was just gifted. You just, because that's the, that's the story you always hear. It's like, oh, they're so talented, lucky them. So again, it goes back to the dedication thing. And it's a song about the dedication it takes to be a musician and what we call woodshedding. So the hook, it just kind of came to me. Songs just come to me and, yep. and hooks that they just come to me. So I thought, Sting of the Cactus, you really must practice. Like, boom. There's a song. So, you know, Nathan wrote this really cool, catchy riff. And, you know, originally that song was called Talent. Talent. And then I'm like, no, that's not. That doesn't work. So we found a way to make it work. And it's called Sting of the Cactus. And, uh, yeah, it's been my most successful song. What's the next record going to be? Or do you know yet? I do. I'm currently working on an album of all original songs. That is my plan. And that's going to be my 2020. But, of course, I'm doing a lot of... Uh, I'm still working on with Nat King Cole. I've got some dates in Quebec in the new year. And I have a new show called the Rat Pack Songbook Show, which is a lot of fun. Uh, and it has, I've got some guests on that. So I, I have uh, the great Donovan Locke is, uh, was my special guest and Alex Bird. And it's, it gives us an opportunity to, to play jazz and to play these beautiful songs. There's no like, you know, there's no martini glasses or gimmicks. No, you don't come out trying to sound like Sammy. Right? No, it's, right. it's like I said, you know, we don't need that anymore. We have YouTube. Like we can, I can watch anything I want anytime. But what I want is a genuine performance uh, that I've never seen before. You just came back from Quebec. Yes. I saw a clip of a standing ovation. Where were you? Mont Tremblant, one of the best shows I've ever had. Those audiences are amazing over there. La Belle Provence, yes. <laughs> um, and uh, it's just kind of, touring is a lot of fun. It's something I've really, I've always wanted to do more of. So uh, I am working on a lot of exciting opportunities to you know, explore the world. I got to play in Morocco last year, uh, and that was an amazing experience. It was my first time headlining a festival in Tangier. It's called Tan Jazz, and I urge people to go check that one out if you're ever looking for something to do in September, uh, and you can find a way to get there. It's magic. They, the, the festival takes place in a palace, and I was actually like the headliner, so I played this outdoor stage outside the palace, and then right after I was done, they had this like drum squad getting people to go into the palace and then they had like 10 different rooms with four different automated sponsors it was just incredible <laughs> so it, I again I love how jazz brings people together and and how it, it's universal there's a universal thing happening in that music and it's also I think what drew me to scat singing is that it doesn't matter what language you speak you can get what's going on right you know just like a saxophone solo like that that's a beautiful thing you know, um, you don't have to speak English. You know, you can just be a listener and mm -hmm. you get it. And you don't have to get jazz. Yeah. You just have to like music. That's right. Yeah. Um, Oops. That was a little bang. Um, tell me about uh, the local scene. So you're going to be touring more and doing a new record in 2020. Tell me about your feelings of the local scene, like a few favorite clubs. Well, you know, I have the privilege and pleasure of working at a place called 120 Diner. And uh, we've uh, just been there, we've been celebrated our five-year anniversary. And uh, just over four years ago, I stepped in there to play a gig. It was a trio gig with Brandy Disterheft and Allison Young, bass and voice and sax. Owners loved it. It drew like 30 people. I get a call from them. They're like, hey, jazz is lucrative. I was just had to check my phone. They're like, what? <laughs> and so it turns out they were booking comedy in there before only. So uh, I do book the music there now, and, and uh, I have some amazing curators that help me, but we present about 50 live music shows every month. Um, so it's a great place. And uh, another new place that I love to play at is called Drome Taberna. Uh, I, I kind of end up there every night. <laughs> they have an amazing array of really beautiful live music, very diverse, a lot of world music. Only place I know that has like a klezmer jam one night, Arabic jazz the next night. They have, uh, you know, a lot of brass bands and they welcome, it's very friendly. Like the staff there, they're friendly. They love the music. I could easily say, 
easily it's the friendliest place on Queen West yeah pretty much anywhere and that's that's high praise because there are places like the uh, uh, the Tiki Lounge there in Parkdale and places that are also very friendly but that They're place, devoted to the music. Yeah, they, they, they it's about this, live music and it's friendship. About yeah. Live music and community and cheap pierogies. Cheap pierogies. <laughs> yeah, the food there is very, very affordable and it's good. So Drum Taberta, one twenty diner, and then what about some of the obvious ones like uh, Lula Lounge? Oh yeah, you gotta love Lula Lounge. And You've sung there a lot, right? I have. I've yeah. been at Lula quite a few times at Hughes Room Live. Love Hughes Room Live. Not a bad seat in the house. You, wherever you are, you can well, see the stage. I, I Great love, sound. I love playing there. Yeah. Because it just feels, even though it's like a 200 seat room, it feels like a living room. It's got this magical thing going on. You know what I respect about that place and, and places like the Jazz Bistro is quiet policy. You know, you're there for the music. It's yep. a concert. Uh, Jazz Bistro, yeah. Jazz as you Bistro mentioned. does that too. Um, you know, Homesmith Bar. Yeah, the Home only bar. quiet bar, lobby bar I've ever seen in a hotel that books high class uh, music. Right? Yeah. Like, there's no other hotel I can even think of. Not one in in Toronto, at yes, least. Yes. And where shout out, shout they have to, a beautiful piano and great music. And shout out to Faye Olson who does a, such an amazing job. You know, booking that room and and you know it, it's a beautiful place. It's elegant. You know, each room's a little bit different, which I love, you know, because everyone has their own uh, taste. Yeah. And there's different ways to consume and enjoy live music. And the Rex Hotel for where all the kids get their chops, where sure. they all, all the people jam. Sure. O old, young. Yes. The everybody Rex in between. been there forever. Uh, La Rev in the Junction. Young people get I their starts there too, right? Friday nights with Le Petit Nouveau. That's a great place to go. It's a great place to discover, uh, and the great food. Oh Mexican my god! Food, right? And they even just got a new chef, and it's even better than before. Really crazy. Um, and then Reservoir Lounge. Yes, they, that would be almost like Drum Taberna, where you walk in there and you're at home. Basically, you're just. I, I'm almost always there on Thursday nights to see and hear Allison Young, whether she's leading her band or playing with somebody else's band. She's just like, yeah. Oh. She's Queen so Pepper as well. Yes, Queen yeah, Pepper. Amazing. Yes. So we have a pretty healthy scene here, you think? We do. But you know what? I always feel like we could be doing more because I feel like live music is becoming more and more of an underground thing. And uh, I, I feel like we all need to be out there promoting it. And that's why I, I do that on my Instagram because it. it I think the hardest part is getting people to go to see live music for the first time if they don't do it already. Because they don't know, they may not know that it's a unique experience with, you know, vibrations. The, the way that live music can, can make you feel is different from a CD player, right? You're in a group. It's like a comedy on TV. You might chuckle by yourself, but if you're in a comedy club, you'll laugh out loud with everyone. It's going to be funnier. It's going to be more enjoyable because you're in a group. And live music does that, right? So it I brings always, everybody together. I do say, you know, if, if you're having a birthday party, try to do it in a live music venue. Watch what happens, you know? And because we need to get, I think the one thing our scene is missing a little bit is people who go, and I don't think it's just our scene, by the way. I think it's global. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough people that just go out for the sake of going out to hear live music. Like, you, it's it's very artist-driven, you know, a lot of the time. Right. I don't want to see something I've never seen before or I don't yeah, know. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. You know, it's like uh, whenever I visit New York City, uh, I, I, I go to a club and it's just full of people. You know, and I'd love to see that in Toronto more. I'd love to see people just going out because that's a destination. That's La Rev. They've got music. Let's see what they've got tonight. Oh, who's this? What's an example of something in the last month or two that you went out and saw, didn't know anything about, and that really affected you? Well, let's think about that. Uh, I often go actually to the Cameron House, and that's an institution. You know, and that's not necessarily jazz. I it just, could be anything. It could be yeah. anything. You know, a lot of country music. Um, in fact, there's this cat. Uh, he's new in town. He's in his mid twenties. He's a bass player. His name is Matt Coldwell, and he is just this incredible player with brilliant energy on the bass. And he's very in demand in country bands and jazz. 
and he's going to be in my trio uh, for an upcoming gig at Drome Taverna. Mm -hmm. um, there's an example. Like, I knew nothing. I knew nothing. Like, the first time I heard him, I was just like, who is this guy? You know, uh, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of just great talent in this town. It's a music town. When is your Drum to Burner show? Yes, so that is Sunday, December 29th, and it's a late one. It's a 10 p.m. start. That's two days away from now, so good timing. December 29th. Yes. There you go. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's going to be uh, Matt Coldwell, and it's going to be Tak Arikushi, who uh, plays in Le Petit Nouveau. Great guitar player. A great guitar player, and this violin player named Mo M. Mitchell. He is a former student of Drew Jareka. He just knocks my socks off. He will, I mean, this guy, like he plays with so much heart and such virtuosity. And that's the thing. I mean, if you ever listen to Charlie Parker, it's not just that he could play a lot of notes really fast. It's that he did it with heart and he made you feel something. So, you know, these three cats are all ones that I've been kind of jamming with the mm -hmm. past year. I've been running into them on the scene, and I thought, to end the year with a bang, my last gig of the decade, we're going to play some new songs. I'm going to teach them some of my originals. We'll have a rehearsal. Let's see what happens next. I look forward to hearing your 2020 record, but even more than that, thank you for promoting all the stuff you do because we're all in this together and hopefully you'll get other people to do that too and get more and more people to promote each other. Absolutely. Cool. I mean, we're all, as I see it, we're all family here. Cheers. Cheers. Ori Dagan, thanks for all you do. What a sweet guy, hard working and always positive. All right, next week, join me. I'm not even sure who my guests will be. Uh, January is a little bit slow in the club, so when you're going out between now and February, it means more than ever to musicians and club owners. So please, even if the weather's not so nice, it's cozy inside of a jazz club. And I hope you'll get out there and support live music. See you next week.